This week on CrossFeed. Religion and schools. Turn off your phone before the service so you can have it blessed. And Haiti, God, the earthquakes, and yes, we are Pat Robertson. Well, we're not, but... <laughs> Actually, this is Crosby News. I'm Pastor Jim Butler in from the brownest state in the Union, out in <laughs> just outside Boston, Massachusetts, at St. Luke's Lutheran Church. Hi, everybody. I'm Pastor Dale Critchley, Pastor of Shepherd of the Ridge Lutheran Church in North Ridgeville, Ohio, outside of Cleveland, right next to uh, Elyria, where the president's going to be tomorrow. Uh, which, by the time you see this, it'll be I don't know when I'm going to get this out. Hopefully, hopefully next, within the next day or two. So it'll be past tense by the time you actually see this. But um, you know, schools are being canceled and all kinds of stuff because of it. So we cancel our schools for natural disasters and snowstorms. So which is this? <laughs> I'm not touching that. <laughs> <laughs> I think you should go tomorrow and wear a Scott Brown T-shirt. <laughs> I think my I got this shirt for Christmas, my Cantina Band um, mm. T-shirt. So, um, oh, but today I I gotta tell you, today felt like Christmas for us. Uh, this is so cool. Um, I I got a phone call from one of our members. All right, actually, I have to back up a little bit. This past, I think I mentioned this last week, we had a, an open house for um, all of our members and, and friends in the um, in the Ohio, uh, in, you know, in this area, and um, and so we had, we had a, a pretty good turnout from people from church that that came and had cookies and cheese and sausage and all kinds of stuff like that, and um, so then today I get this phone call, and it's one of our members, and she says, um. One of my neighbors, if I'm understanding it right, um, concentrate, Pinky, concentrate, passed away, and so their her daughter's in the process of selling her condo, and so they're clearing everything out of it, and the um, there's some furniture here, and including a dining room table, and chairs and a hutch and some other stuff. And she says, the, the dining room table is way too big for my tiny condo, but you guys have, I noticed uh, when I was there at the open house, you guys have a nice, good-sized dining room. And so I was, so I mentioned that to, uh, to this daughter, and she said, oh, for a pastor, well, he can have it for free. So, uh, oh, okay. Well, thing is, we have been using the same dining room table um, for uh, since we were married. And um, no, when did we get that one? Life moves pretty fast. Okay. Well, anyway. It, um, it's a this dining room table is uh, uh, you know it's just a it's a, just a cheap squeaky for my good table that we had and um, it, it did the job you know but we talked about really would like to get a nice wooden one and that and um, but it was just we couldn't really afford to go out and buy a, a new table and stuff and so this one comes along it's beautiful it's uh you know, it's it's good size for uh, um, for our family and everything, and um, expandable. And then this uh, this hutch is huge, and um and and just really nice looking hutch. And then they had these display cabinets, and uh, we took one of those. My wife collects little precious moments kind of things. And so uh, we've got a, a display cabinet for that now. Of course, I said, well, we can fit the table once we take the leaves out of it um, into our 
minivan, but so the, the hutch is so huge and it's in it's all one piece, so we couldn't take it apart. So I called a guy from the congregation that has a pickup truck, and he said, yeah, I'll be right over. And he came over, helped me haul this stuff, and um, and so now it's all in our dining room. And so we're so excited. I mean, just all this stuff was just given to us, and we're just so thankful for this stuff because, you know, we'd looked around for a display case for a long time, too, but it was just, it wasn't happening, and and now we have it. And it was just such a such a huge blessing to just out of the blue from somebody that I've never even met. Cool. Well, such things happen and they are great blessings when they do. And I, I, so I guess you brought this table in and and gave it a proper blessing. (laughs) I have no idea what that meant. (laughs) This is, this is a, a, when I um, planned on using this story, I didn't realize how short of a story it actually was. This is this is just it's one. A, by the way, this is gonna be a short episode, folks. We don't have much to talk about here other than Haiti, uh, yeah. but that might be enough. But uh, um, or or the or the newest Massachusetts miracle. We may talk about that too. Uh, <laughs> but uh, the, uh, but anyway, <laughs> are you a God fearing man, Senator? So um. This is in London. It's uh, Canon David Parrott at St. Lawrence Jewry Church. And um, they had a, it's a, a back-to-work, traditional back-to-work ceremony they call a Plow Monday ceremony. And, but, you know, for their congregation that's not farmers, they're not going to have a blessing of the plows. And uh, so instead, they had a blessing of the cell phones and laptops, and um, and they had people hold up their cell phones, and they placed laptops and phones on the altar, and and had a blessing of the phones. Did you ever do a um, uh, blessing of the seed or blessing of the soil out when you were out in Iowa? Because when I was in down in Concordia, Missouri, I remember every year the. Um, they would have a uh, the, they would bring in a, a jar, a clear jar of dirt, and st- another jar of seed. And the pastor would take some of the seeds, and then you know symbolically place them in the dirt and cover over them. And then they had another guy had a, a ewer of water, and so he'd pour the water on it. And then they would pray for the crops and everything. Uh, this was you know during planting season in the spring. And so it'd be kind of a kind of the same thing of plow uh, a plow service, a, a blessing of the soil and a blessing of the seed. Uh, asking God's thing. So I think this is kind of cool, you know, mm-hmm. um, you know, especially we as Lutherans. I mean, you know, because we're supposed to be big on, you know, the, the doctrine of vocation. But yeah. how often do we, you know, encourage people and say, you know, let's, let's, let's bless these people and their vocations. Right. You know, and you got to understand, it's not like they're like sort of, you know, oh, you know, some sort of magic we're going to say some words over this and all of a sudden your business is going to prosper or something like that. All right. What we're asking for is for God to be with these people. If it's his will for, for their business to prosper. Great. We, we, you know, we, we pray accordingly. Um, but you know, what I would say is more than anything is, is to pray that, uh, that people will be blessed through their work. Um, that God would use, their various occupations um, to be a blessing to to those around them, to the um, you know t- to their customers or clients or, or whatever, um, you know. And yeah, it's it's a vocation thing. It's a it's acknowledging that whatever work you do, um, provided that your work is not uh, you know sinful, um, that that God you are acting as God's hands. Uh, or as uh, um, Luther would say, a mask of God, um, that you are, God is using you to bless those around you. It's just like when we pray for the, um, for the sick, right? We pray that mm-hmm. God would give the doctors and nurses um, and various other medical professionals uh, the skills and resources that they need to, to do his work. 
Uh, whenever I'm uh, at a nursing home, there's two nursing homes up here. I do a service at once a month each, and I always pray for the staff. I always pray that God would make their their work a joy because I mean, you know, taking care of the senior saints because I mean that's that's very difficult work. Uh, and can be very depressing and stuff as you get close to these people and they die on you all the time. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, I pray, you know, the, that's why I always remember to pray for them and stuff. And, you know, some of the staff who, you know, to bring the people in and out, they always appreciate me doing that and thinking of them. And so I think this, you know, uh, I think this kind of thing might be, you know, uh, Labor Day. That might be a good day, you know, for us to do that because that's really supposed to be a weekend when we, you know, we, we, we celebrate. Uh, you know, the gift of work in our mm-hmm. country, the workers. Uh, so I think that could be a real op- neat, neat opportunity to, to, to take part in that. Well, you know, it's a good point, too, because, you know, like Memorial Day, Veterans Day, and all that kind of stuff, you know, we tend to to thank God for the vocation of soldier. Um, but most other occupations are, you know, for some reason, we sort of push them aside. And, you know, certainly for, for soldiers whose, whose occupation puts their lives in danger, um, you know, we have, uh, every, every week we have a prayer for, um, all of those who are in, um, who have occupations that place them in danger, soldiers, police officers, mm-hmm. firefighters, um, and, and then we have a list of those people. Um, that are somehow connected to our congregation and we pray for them every week. Um, but, you know, that's not to, to say that, that other occupations are, uh, less honorable or, or less godly or, or you know, or, or anything like that. Um, so. I was the Gales congregation honors the vocation of pastor there getting a table on Hutch today. So, you know. <laughs> I, I tell you, man, you know, I, I, I know um by faith that uh that that heaven is better than this but i you know i'm having a pretty hard time imagining that <laughs> i i'm sitting in our dining room by the front dining room table and it was a gift from a congregation member who left and moved to a nursing home and uh table and hutch and stuff yeah it is it's cool when you get gifts like that and it's cool to cool to be remembered so but i think this kind of stuff um you know remembering people and all their ways of work uh, it's really cool. Um, it's interesting because I think we have a blessing of a house in our, in our, in our right, but I don't know if we have a blessing of a, a, a place of work. You know, it's like if a you member of congregation started a new business or something. But maybe some way to think about how to lift up work. Well, I know um, for a fact that it, there's nothing in the agenda for blessing of the cell phones. Okay. Uh, and obviously in Texas, you shouldn't go down and try to bless the local, local public school. That's not a good thing either. Yeah. At least some of them think so. Uh, now, Texas, um, like California, is one of the biggest textbook uh, markets in the country. And their state board of education is the group that determines what the textbooks need to say. And because of that, then, uh, textbook publishers, um, when you got one of the biggest markets, they're going to cater to that market. Therefore, pretty much what Texas wants, almost every other state in the union is going to be affected by that. Also, I've often wondered, what if the Texas says A and California says B, because those are the two biggest markets in the country. Um, you know, what happens if they, they, they go different ways? Do we have two completely different curriculums or what? But anyway, in um, they're looking over a new social studies uh, curriculum, which would be so- sociology, psychology, American history, world history, those types of things. And they were going to take a vote uh, today, actually, said um, tentatively on Thursday, which would be today, or last Thursday. This is January 13th, so maybe even January 14th, to talk about um, history textbooks in the next decade. They were going to do a tentative vote, final vote, supposed to be in March. And they had 130 people signed up for the public meeting. And some people say, we want more Hispanic historical figures. 
Uh, some probably want more black historical figures. Some probably want more women history, historical figures. Uh, some want uh, more positive spin on Texas history. And that's just great in Massachusetts, man. You know, reading about Texas history. Um, U.S. history. Well, you and know, then they want, some people- when you talk about, you know, uh, the Alamo and, you know, and all that kind of stuff and uh, the whole, I mean, Texas history is, uh, has a lot more impact on the on the United States than a lot of other states' histories do. And so, um, you know, how is that presented? Is that presented as they're a bunch of, you know, secessionists or, um, or, or you know, how is that done? And so... I can, or how the whole Spanish-American War, or Mexican-American War, rather, represented. Right. Um, but then there's the issue of religion. How... Do you describe religion and its course in American history? Right. Because you can't just ignore it. I mean, it's it's had such a huge impact on our history that to ignore it is to not teach history. So Because, you know, we all know the Puritans, you know, came over because they wanted to purify something. And they wanted um, freedom to... Do something, and uh, you know, and so they came, and you know, they 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 started Harvard to train men to be something in their somethings. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and Yale and Princeton, and you know, those schools were all built originally, you know, with the purpose of training men to be to something. I, you know, it's, it's, you know, they all have something in common. I haven't figured out what it is yet. Uh, so uh, obviously there is yeah just a tremendous um uh religious history in America. I mean the founding of the Plymouth Bay Colony, the Bay uh Massachusetts Bay Colony, Providence, Rhode Island, which was originally found to be Baptist, Pennsylvania, which was the Quaker state, uh and, and developed for Quakers and the first was religious li- complete religious liberty. So there yeah, it's a very thing. So anyway, there's this um but the question is, how do you talk about it, and at the same time, not give this romanticized view that um, you know the United States was built on quote Christian principles unquote, right? Um, or you know, uh, um, or that you know all the founding fathers the fathers were necessarily Christian, which they weren't. No, I am your father. No, so. Yeah, and, and this is a tough thing, and, and the reality is is that nobody's going to agree on how much emphasis to give it. You know, I, um, it's been interesting for me with um, one of my kids in high school having uh, doing world history and learning about the Reformation in a public school. You know, and, and how does, how do they teach that? And, and she was actually pretty impressed with, you know, she kind of, well, I could add a whole lot more, you know, <laughs> but, you know, how, how do they teach uh, something like that where you've got Protestant kids and you got Catholic kids sitting there? How do you teach that? You know, mm-hmm. and, um, so it's, it's, it's tough to do to, to balance properly without, um, Promoting you, one you, religion over another. You teach it saying John Oz, uh, Eric Erickson was right, and it was all issues that Luther had with his father. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, that's not the way it was taught here. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, uh, um, and, and it's interesting because there's a couple of, uh, you know, there are the religious right people down in Texas who, you know, want to, you know, kind of want more. And then there are others who want less. And uh, it was called the Texas Freedom Network. And it's, uh, I don't know if the guy's the head of it or if he was just part of it, but he's the Dean of Humanities at uh, Baylor University. And University of Mary Harden uh, dash Baylor and director of its uh, Center for Religious uh, Liberty. And he says, what violates the Constitution is presenting material that either prefers Christianity over other faiths 
or depicts the United States as a Christian nation in some legal sense or constitutional sense. Now, I, I'm not sure what he means by that prefers Christianity over other faiths. Uh, cause certainly Christianity had a deeper influence than other faiths. Mm-hmm. Um, I think we had a bad influence on her. You know, and really you could write a history really that one of the issues of, of, of religion was adapting to the American culture. I mean, uh, God, reform Judaism and, and, um, Conservative Judaism or adapt adaptations to the American culture. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But uh, I'm not sure how you can say that the United States, Christianity didn't have a, when you have like the first and second great awakening, how it didn't have a stronger impact than other religions. Right. I, thought, I like this quote here the Reverend Marcus McFall, senior pastor at Highland Park Baptist Church in Austin said, the instruction of religious faith, discipleship, and a life of service, one shaped by devotion and piety, is the responsibility of each faith community, whether church, synagogue, or mosque. It's the responsibility of parents and parishes, not public schools. And, you know, as much as a lot of people would love to see, you know, um, Christianity taught in public schools or something like that, more more of a religious focus in public schools, I'm not a big fan. Um and I I agree with this guy, all right? Parents, don't slack off and think that, you know, that you can just have the public school teach this stuff to your kids, because guess what? They're not going to do it right. Well, I, absolutely. Faith, discipleship, the life of service, that that is caught in your parents. You don't teach that in a classroom. Um, mm-hmm. What you need, but, but the, you know, the question is, is how do you give... Um, a proper, or a textbook, uh, a, a proper interpretation of the role of Christianity in the American life. Yeah. And in the history of America. And, you know, uh, that's, there's good and bad. You know, um, more specifically, I would say, of Christians, you know, um, at various times, that things that, that, people have done in the name of Christianity. You know, there's good and bad. There's there's certainly things that, you know, good things that have happened uh, because of, of Christians' influences. Um, there's been bad things, too, where people have, have just done ridiculous things and, and said it was because they're Christians. Um, yeah. They're right. People have said ridiculous things because, you know, just because they're, and they've said ridiculous things because... They made deals with the devil. Yeah. I'm sorry. You just gave the most, you know, perfect segue into Haiti and Pat Roberts than I could ever possibly ask for. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> you know, All right. All right. So, so unless you've been, you know, living under a rock. Um, wow. That was probably it. Oh, sorry. Um, uh, You've you've heard about Pat Robertson's take on Haiti, um, that he said that it was because they made a deal with the devil 200 years ago to get the French out, and so, um, which... Oh, good grief. ...is ridiculous. Um, even the White House said it was stupid. <laughs> Um, and uh, there's this great uh, letter uh, in the Minneapolis Star Tribune, uh, so great that it is <laughs> it's being distributed. Uh, this this letter to the editor sort of thing has gone viral. Um, all right, and so it's written uh, by Satan. Uh, the actual person that wrote it is Lily Coyle, uh, but she says, or or Satan um, says. Dear Pat Robertson, I know that you know that all press is good press, so I appreciate the shout-out. And you make God look like a big, mean bully who kicks people when they're down, so I'm all over that action. But when you say that Hades made a pact with me, it is totally humiliating. I may be evil incarnate, but I'm no welcher. The way you put it, making a deal with me leaves folks desperate and impoverished. Sure, in the afterlife, but when I strike bargains with people, they first get something here on earth. Glamour, beauty, talent, wealth, fame, glory, a golden fiddle. 
I like that one. Um, those Haitians have nothing, and I mean nothing. And that was before the earthquake. Haven't you seen Crossroads or Damn Yankees? If I had a thing going with Haiti, there'd be lots of banks, skyscrapers, SUVs, exclusive nightclubs, Botox, that kind of thing. An 80% poverty rate is so not my style. Nothing against it. I'm just saying, not how I roll. You're doing great work, Pat, and I don't want to clip your wings. Just, come on, you're making me look bad. And not the good kind of bad. Keep blaming God. That's working. But leave me out of it, please. Or we may need to renegotiate your own contract. <laughs> Best. Satan. <laughs> I think you know what the problem is just as well as I do. Oh, man. That, was, I mean, that was just such an awesome letter. But, it, you know, it really kind of got to the point that, you know, what, they've, they've got some kind of curse, you know, but it's, it's ridiculous. I, I mean, well, but it does bring the question, why does God let these things happen? Why do the innocent suffer? You know, when you pray for the victims, you know, does God really listen, you know? Uh, um, Monsignor Lorenzo Albacetti um, says, you know, to what kind of God can one pray in such circumstances? Uh, and then in another place, um, uh, a religious, uh, another story from the from the AP, um, uh, a follower, you know, said, uh, you know, uh, Remy Poulevard uh, was his name. He has five children, and they who you know beneath the rubble of a home. How can God do this to us? There is no God, and you get that whole area of what's called you know the correct my pronunciation. He always pronounced it theodicy, um, mm. but you know trying to defend God when we in face of things generally human tragedy. But it's the reality that God doesn't cause destruction. You know, we are in a fallen world, and because of that, destruction happens. But it's not that God sat there and, you know, looked at Haiti and said, time for you to go. You know, uh, Pat Robertson's, you know, good buddy Oral Roberts to the contrary, you know, I don't think that's how God works, you know, saying, well, do things for me or time for you to go. Well, you know, this is the flip side of the theology of glory. You know, we, we talk about um, this uh, name it, claim it sort of prosperity gospel. Well, the flip side is, okay, well, if I'm rich and wealthy and comfortably well off and a happy miser, um, that must be because I have a tremendous faith. And, you know, Hollywood is your classic example of that. Oh, wait. Um, well, anyway, the... Uh, you know, the flip side of that is, okay, well, if I'm poor and, you know, and literally my life is crumbling around me, then what does that mean? That must mean that I've done something horribly wrong to offend God. Well, you know, speaking of buildings falling down, you know, they asked Jesus, hey, the Tower of Siloam, it fell over, it killed all these people, um, you know, who who sinned there? What, what was the deal? And, and um, you know, and, and you, here you've got this man born blind. Who sinned, him or his parents? You know, and and stuff. And and Jesus says no. You know, and and it was really interesting. He says no. That, that happened. That that God may be glorified. And in another spot, he says, um, he basically says that um, this is just a, a sign of, of things to come. That you know, the reality is we live in a fallen world, but. And and here's the you know the, but w w while we can't say you know this happened because I mean I like how they worded it in here um, that it's it's geological not theological, <laughs> All right? And that's exactly right, right? Because we live in a fallen world that doesn't function the way that it's supposed to, right? Because of sin. And now so so here you know. Pat Roberts says that God is the one that, that caused this to happen, all right, as a punishment, all right? And I was thinking about this, and actually, if you want to blame somebody, blame Jesus, but follow, you got to follow my, my reasoning on this, okay? These sort of things happen because we live in a fallen world. We live in a fallen world because... Adam and Eve brought sin into the world, and ever since then, we've all been under the curse of sin, not only for their sins, but for our own sin, okay? 
It's not that God punishes us for any specific sins or, or punishes us for our sins at all. Rather, he punished Jesus in our place. Jesus took on the responsibility and blame for all of our sin, all sin that of all people who ever have lived and ever will live. Okay? So he took the blame for all the sin that is, and for the curse that the world is under. All right? So therefore, if you want to blame someone, blame Jesus. It's not that he caused this, like Robertson is saying, but he is the one that took the blame for it. And because he did, we can be assured that this is not God punishing Haiti for something that happened 200 years ago, because he already punished Jesus. Even if the, the government of Haiti did make a pact with the devil, all right, which is just some sort of, you know, legend, okay, even if they did, that's completely irrelevant because God because Jesus paid for that sin. God already punished Jesus for that. And so, that's a moot point. Hey, God, my brilliant! Uh, okay, but that worked. Mike, I followed your argument. I think it's a very good one. Um, you know, I, but, but please, um, you know, don't hear us as, you know, saying, yeah, the Haitians aren't to blame. And, you know, ultimately, I don't think like this stuff, you know, yeah, it was a sign of God's judgment on the world, you know, and would, it, and that's just causes us to look more forward to the day when Jesus comes back and puts the world back to where it's supposed to be. Right. Uh, but, right. you know, yeah, there, there, I mean, we've seen so many, so many great disasters, whether they be hurricanes or earthquakes or tsunamis, uh, and, and they're terrible things. Uh, we would encourage you, you know, our, our listeners to please take part in giving and donating to Haiti. Uh, relief efforts, um, uh, especially those guys who are Lutheran, uh, either through the uh, EL, uh, LCMS World Relief and Human Care or Lutheran World Relief. Uh, I'm not sure what the ELCA's. Um, yep, uh, ELCA and Wisconsin are. both have theirs, and um, yep. and I'll even and, and it's, I'm not one to plug businesses, um, and I'm, in fact, even as a Lutheran, I'm not one to plug Thrivent. But if you're a Thrivent member and you haven't heard. Um, they are doing a matching um, deal where for every two dollars you donate, they'll donate an extra dollar. So um, that's a nice way to you can uh, go to thrivent.com and, and get the information on that. Um, always nice to you know if you can give if if you can make your dollars go further. Um, but otherwise, you know, if you want to donate to the Red Cross or Doctors Without Borders, um, you know, there's there's plenty of organizations. Um, I will mention Mark Driscoll the uh, pastor from Mars Hill, um, mm -hmm. he went down there to assess the damage and to see what they can do. Um, go to If you go to uh, usatoday.com, um, there's an interview with him there. He talks about it. I've been following him on Twitter while he was down there because um, he was posting updates on Twitter and Facebook. And one of the things he mentioned is that... Um, I mean, he he was talking about they were they were standing there. All of a sudden, they heard this pop, pop, and then um, they found a kid laying dead and just killed for no reason because it's mm. it it's um it's anarchy down there right now. I mean, it was bad enough before, and now it's just I mean it's worse. Yeah, because the um the churches kind of were holding things together and and really were the the source of order. And, um, you know, so many of them are, are have just kind of fallen apart. So, Sorry. Which, by the way, reminds me that Pat Robertson's not the only one saying weird things. Um, <laughs> um, there are some guys even in Haiti. Um, so uh, uh, this one guy is uh, Richard Morse, a uh, Haitian-American musician. His mother was a singer and revered voodoo priestess. Um, you know, uh, um, you know, he says uh, it, this was a sign of uh, that the allowed the uh, corrupt light-skinned leaders to uh, uh, prosper while the black-skinned darker majority have been punished. And suddenly... Um, 
The Justice Ministry is down, National Palace is down, United Nations headquarters is down, but the famous bronze statue of the unknown escaped slave, that's stand still up. And that's good. And he says, uh, uh, every major Catholic church, including the 81-year-old cathedral, was were all destroyed. Um, and, you know, that's that's the judgment on the church because all this corruption is going on and the church didn't say anything. They just kind of watched it. So he's drinking the same Kool-Aid as Pat Robinson. It, it, it doesn't... Right. Just a slightly it, different flavor. Yeah. He's, he's, he has an orange instead of grape. So, uh, uh, on the other hand, I thought it was interesting to discover that, 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 that this article that Haiti Haiti is a majority Roman Catholic, but a lot of them also practice voodoo. Well, voodoo is uh, it's kind of it's like Roman Catholic and animism, and you throw them in a blender, and you know, and so it's kind of this mix of of both, and they're both state religions too. <laughs> Talk about church and state. So that's really kind of interesting. Um, I, you know, what it comes, there was the end of this uh, article from the Washington Post just really saddened me. It's a Sunday night as downtown residents began burning some of the bodies that have been rotting in the streets for five days. A woman walking by in an orange dress pulled out a copy of the Bible and she flung it into the fire. It just, that just tore me apart. And because the thing is, this is what the people okay. there need. Well, okay. Number one, did she throw it in there out of anger? Was the book maybe ruined? And so she threw it into the fire because it was, you know, destroyed to having been in the rubble, ripped apart. Um, did she, could she read? Did she even realize what it was? Yeah. I mean, I looked at that, Oh, you know, and, and I had to ask, so many questions, you know. I mean, because the way the, the article read, it sounded like, you know, this was an act of, you know, God's not here and I'm going to, you know. But um, that may be true. That may not be true. Yeah. You know, yeah, I don't know. Good point. I mean, the only thing you can say is she threw the Bible on the fire. But you don't know what her motivation was, what she was thinking, what she was intending to say by that. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Um, Impressive. Hey, I know I'm from Massachusetts. We like it Scott Brown. Everybody's trying to figure out what that was all about. <laughs> <laughs> the reality is that what the people need more than anything is the message that the Bible brings, right? And that is the message that even when your world is crumbling around you, even when you've lost everything, even when you've lost those things that you hold most dear to you, like your family, all right? And if you've been watching any kind of news, you've heard some of the stories, all right? But even all of that death and destruction is not victorious because Jesus is coming back and he is going to fix it, all right? In the midst of all of this, we have hope. We have assurance that God is bigger than this tragedy. God is bigger than the earthquake. God is bigger than the poverty. God is bigger than, than the disease and the suffering and all of that. Right? He knows what it's like because he's been there. He's been through it. And so the message is that all of this pain, all of the suffering is going to come to an end when he comes back. As Christians, we can say it's going to be okay and really honestly mean it, not just some platitude. And meanwhile, and this is something that, that just continues to astonish me about God, is that God can take something like this that is absolutely horrible. I mean, it is, in and of itself, just horrible beyond comprehension. And he can pull good out of it. Not to say that it's good that it happened, but 
Look what's happening because of it. People from all over the world are pulling together to help out this country. And this is a country that has needed help for a very, very long time. All right, I already mentioned 80% poverty. Mm -hmm. right? So now all of a sudden people are noticing this country and they're saying, hey, we need to help these people. All right, this guy that's saying, hey, the church should have been saying something, he is right about that. All right, I'm not sure, you know, I don't know enough about Haitian politics to know what they could have said or done. Okay, I'm not saying pointing fingers or anything like that. But at the same time, it is true that they've needed help and um, they haven't been getting the help that they need. All right, all of a sudden people are helping them. All right, when this is, when all is said and done, you know, maybe 10, 20 years from now, chances are they will be better off then than they were two weeks ago. Now, that doesn't erase all of the pain and suffering. That doesn't erase all of the, um, you know, all the, all the families who were a family of five and now are a family of one and, you know, and, and, and all of that. That doesn't get rid of that, all right? To those people that are suffering, to them we have the message of the resurrection. But even, I mean, just looking at the big picture of uh, as far as this country goes, God is still able, even now, it's not that it's not that the only message that we have is well it's going to get better when Jesus comes back that you know even if he waits to come back that he will still pull good out of this you know just look at people from you know here here's a here's a bipartisan issue for you all right everyone believes that we need to help these people and and when you know we're so focused on the, all the sort of ridiculous you know what's Tiger Woods, you know, who's he with this week or, or, or whatever, you know, all of a sudden that stuff just isn't all that important. What's really important is that, you know, and then you got your, your stars and that, that are doing benefits and, and, and all this kind of stuff to, um, to raise awareness, to help people out and, and stuff like that. I even on, um, uh, on Facebook, I, I'm a fan of V, you know, the TV series with the aliens that we, we talked about a few episodes ago. All right. I got a Facebook message from them, from, who, you know, so from NBC or whatever, um, but saying, from you know, from the visitors <laughs> saying, help out the people in Haiti. You can text this. No I can't remember the number now. If you text Haiti to a certain number and it, you automatically will donate $10 to the Red Cross, you know, for relief in Haiti. And, and it was just kind of strange to be getting that message um, from that source. But the reality is, is the tragedy brings people together because they realize, oh, my life, you know, and, and the things that, the, the sort of petty things that are important to me on a daily basis, that stuff is, is nothing when you're talking about, you know, human suffering on, a, on this massive scale. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, these things happen, and, and it's bad that it happens, but God says, yeah, it is, but I'm good, and, and so I'm going to be with you, and it helps us realize um, who he is and, and how wonderful he is that, that he is there with us through all this stuff. Oh, very nice, Blaine. I couldn't put that any better myself. Did a wonderful job. Very comforting words. Again, we do encourage you to, uh, if you have not yet given to support, to Haiti support, please do so. Um, whether it be through um, an agency such as the Red Cross or through your uh, denomination. Mm -hmm. uh, or even uh, uh, or e even the uh, atheist uh, non-believers donate to Haiti group. I don't care. Yeah, um, yeah, there is one. Uh, uh, yeah. Richard Dawkins is is yep. is promoting and he's saying, hey, you know, us non-believers, you know, we're uh, we, we, we care too. Helping people out too. And 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 I, I I actually posted that one on Facebook and, and Twitter too and said, hey. You know, because I've got a lot of atheist friends on Facebook, and he said, you know, I, I, you know, at this point, the, the Haitians don't care who they're getting their money from. 
all right? And I firmly believe that, um, you know, that you don't have to be uh, religious. Uh, I don't really like that term, but, um, you, you know, you don't have to believe in God, all right, to be moral and to recognize the need to help those who are suffering, all right? And uh, so if, if you rather do that to just to send a message uh, that, that, hey, just because I'm an atheist doesn't mean I'm not going to help people out, then by all means, you know, that's, that's fine. Do it through there. It's, either way, it's going to help people in need. So we do pray again, then also, yes, to pray for the people of Haiti. Uh, pray that God would watch over all of you and that he would give you a good week in his grace. Thank you again for listening. If you got any comments, we always look forward to them at podcast at crossfeednews.com. Did you say condiments? No, I said comments. Okay. If you have any Just comments clarifying. you'd like to make, you can make them at podcast at crossfeednews.com. Okay. Just clarifying because, you know, it's it's a Gmail account and it doesn't accept relish, so. <laughs> okay. Sorry. But, uh... <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Oh, yeah, thank you, everybody. Again, God bless. Be with you. God bless you.